to Bugs and Blue Jays. Your place for everything related to the Toronto Blue Jays. Here's your hosts, Jesse Burrell and Riley McConnell. Now let's get on with the show. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 141 of Buds and Blue Jays. This is your place for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm your host, Jesse Burrell, joined as always by my co-host, Riley McConnell. And we are now into our second episode of the offseason. So if you're with us, thank you. Very much appreciate it. Stick with us all winter as we will get into a lot of the fun stuff. Blue Jays related, all the breaking news, all the trades, all the free agency, all the good stuff that happens during the offseason. But for this episode... Riley and I are going back to school where uh, we had mixed results in our school, in our schooling days. But uh, this time, we're not the ones in the seats. We are the ones grading the papers. And we are going to analyze what happened from the Toronto Blue Jays, who has been studying, who has been taking notes, who gets straight A's from us, and who had a disastrous year, gets an F and might have to be held back a grade. Plus, we've also got some news and notes. Gold Glove dominations have been made. There's some in, um, news news in the Blue Jays front office and on the coaching staff and so much more. But first, before we get into all that, Riley, I've just got to ask, how have you been enjoying playoff baseball without the Toronto Blue Jays so far? Well, Jesse, that's a pre- pretty easy question to ask. I haven't been enjoying it. Um, I will probably tune in uh, in the World Series like I do. Well, I can't even say that. I think this year bit a little more than previous years where I definitely watch, you know, the rest of division series and the championship series, both AL and National League. But um, no, I know there's, hey, there's a big game tonight with uh, with the Astros and uh, the Rangers, but I'm just not with it, man. I am just not with it. I will probably watch the World Series. So as much as I'd like to say, yeah, I'm big on baseball right now. You know, I mean, we're not there. At the end of the day, I still know the scores. I still know what's going on. I feel like I'm not missing much, honestly. And I could be just a salty guy for not, you know, wanting to enjoy the beauty that is playoff baseball. But that's just me, man. I know you got the game on the other side of your computer. Uh, You know, you've been watching diligently. You know what's going on. Uh, That's just two different takes, though, guys. Like, hey, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people like me, um, you know, who will tune back in in the World Series. Uh, but for for now, with the four teams remaining in the championship series, uh, if I catch a highlight, you know, that that's probably the best of where I've been the last you know week and a half for baseball. I will say, Riley, you are missing some fun th- stuff. Um, some old friends, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and Gabriel Moreno are doing wild things for the Arizona Diamondbacks. The Phillies and Bryce Harper are fun as hell. But I get it. I get what you're saying. It does leave kind of a sour taste in our mouth with looking at this playoffs go through and thinking like, man. That should be us right now. That could be us. And um, I I said to you before the episode here, but I think playoff baseball was at its best. I think when the Blue Jays were not good and were never making the playoffs because I could actively watch and just appreciate the game for what it was. But it's tough thinking our Blue Jays should be here and doing this and we're not. But anyways, story for another day, Riley. Let's get in to the meat of the episode here. And I want to start with our Toronto Blue Jays and some awards that are given out. Cause as we get into the world series and as we get past this, more awards are going to go out and five Toronto Blue Jays were nominated for gold gloves this year. They are as follows. Alejandro Kirk behind the plate, Matt Chapman at third base, Dalton Varsho for left field, Kevin Kiermeyer in center field, Jose Barrios as pitcher. Before we dive down into each of these and see which one has an argument of actually winning the award, Riley, were there any snubs for the Toronto Blue Jays in this one here? I mean, honestly, in my head, um, Jesse, you're a guy, you're a sabermetric darling. I'm an eyeball test guy, and I know we've been harping on him for the bat in the 2022 season. But uh, Vlad Jr., I thought, uh, certainly could have been a nomination easily at first base. You look at um, all the great defensive plays he made this year. Why he's not on there, I'm not sure. Um, As far as other snubs goes, I feel like, I feel like, you know, they probably got it right. Um, Of course, Kirk is, um, for me, a dark horse. I would have never thought, you know, towards the beginning of career, he would be even a nominee, um, although he does have some of the best pitch framing in the game. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. But yeah, I mean, oh, certainly is, Jesse. But I mean, Vladdy, uh, you know, he could have been there. He had a pretty good year defensively at first, certainly made some, uh, some, highlight real plays to bail out, you know, his left side of the diamond on some throws. But yeah, I mean, hey, Kiermaier, Varsho, Chapman, 
they're elite defenders in the game of baseball. So no surprise there that uh, they were nominated for gold gloves this year. Yeah, Vlad's not there because his range, I think, was quite poor on um, on the getting balls to his right and to his left. But it was also pretty bad last year where he also won a gold glove. So do with that information what you will. But I agree, Riley. I think the Blue Jays got it right. I will say it's incredibly hard to judge pitcher defense. So um, it was Jose Brios actually a good defensive pitcher? I guess he's nominated for an award, so he must have been. But uh, I would not have guessed that going into the season. But let's go down case by case here, and let's start behind the plate, Riley, for the American League um, Gold Glove Award. Alejandro Kirk is going up against Adley Rutschman of the Baltimore Orioles and Jonah Heim of the Texas Rangers. Now, I didn't look up their other defensive stats, but I did look up this for Alejandro Kirk, which if you are making the case on why Kirk should win this award, this is what you bring to the table. You say he had a 17 defensive run saves. It was by far the best in the AL. I think the next closest was eight. That's how much defensive run saves Alejandro Kirk had. His 16.2 defensive war was fourth in the AL. And in terms of framing, Riley, which is the big thing that a lot of sabermetrics guys that like me look at, and probably one of the big reasons that the Toronto Blue Jays starting pitchers pitched so well, was second best in all of baseball behind Kyle Higashioka and only allowed one pass ball all year, Riley. I think that is probably a big thing too. Very good at blocking balls in the plate and all that stuff for Alejandro Kirk. So that's the argument of why Kirk should win a gold glove here. I mean, that's not really an argument. Let's just go on the other side and you're dealing with, you know, an elite catcher in Adley Rutschman. I think, you know, Jonah Heim's a good catcher. Um, I know he's very balanced, can do it to both, uh, both sides of the ball. I think your big um, competitor here is Adley Rutschman. But Jesse, what are they looking for? And I think, you know, the defensive run saved and frame rate just jump right off the page at you. And you have to really consider those two things almost above, you know, the rest of the criteria. I think Kirk has an extremely good chance to win this award. Now I wouldn't be up again, gold gloves and silver sluggers. You know, I don't know who dies for these awards. They're nice to look at on a baseball reference page, for instance, but they don't really mean anything. They're individual accomplishments. We know what we have in Alejandro Kirk, and we're just talking about the defensive side of the ball, is he is probably one of the best pitch framers to ever, you know, step behind home plate and play the position of catcher, and we have that. And whether he wins the award or or not, this is still, he's a very young catcher. He can still improve in this category. And if this is his first gold glove, it could be the first of many across his career. Um, because, I mean, I again, this is a guy who's going to get a lot stronger the more position or the more positional defense you play at a position and catcher is a, is a tough one. So I wouldn't be surprised if Kirk won again. Ali Rutschman, I would say, is probably um, his competitor. If Jonah Heim wins, I mean, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me that say how good Heim is in Rutschman, but I mean, you can make a very strong argument that Kirk, just alone on the pitch framing, is probably going to take the award. Yeah, the only thing I'd say is sometimes historically gold glove awards have actually been to the guy who's been good defensively, but was also good with the bat. And uh, Adley Rutschman was the best hitting catcher out of all three of these here with Kirk being firmly third in this list. But I think Kirk does get this award. I think the voters are smart people. They know their saber metrics, and I think they value that a lot. I'm going to say Kirk gets it. I guess you're saying not, eh? I mean, hey, I, if I think, you know, there's well, there's an award called the Silver Slugger. I If they look at more than defense, then they need to pick new people to pick the awards. Sure, yeah. uh, I, I really think, hey, if, if Alejandro Kirk wins this, I think there's a really good chance. I, I'm not going to lock it. I don't think there's a for sure lock um, on any of these gold gloves uh, for when you match up the Blue Jays because you could easily make the argument for the other guy. But I think out of the Blue Jays that were nominated, I think he probably has – the best case and probably one of, if not the best chance to win this award. All right, Riley, a guy, you know, well, and a guy that was brought over to Toronto to be a good defensive player as well as provide some with the bat, but that is Matt Chapman, a guy who has won platinum gloves before he is up against Jose Ramirez of the Cleveland guardians and Alex Bregman of the Houston Astros. 
Riley, it wasn't his best defensive season, but Matt Chapman is still very, very good. And um, even when you're not at your best, you still put up elite numbers. Third in defensive war, 12 defensive run saves, Riley. The next closest in defensive run saves was Gio Urshela, who had six. So he more than doubled who was next close. His range was third best in baseball, but he did have 12 errors, Riley, which I think was the most in his career. And if you look at stuff like fielding percentage, it was down all the way down to 17th in baseball. And he was 24th in fielding run value too. So not as good a defensive season from um, Matt Chapman as we've seen in the past, but uh, I, we, Chris Bassett and Kevin Gosman have both already made their claims on Twitter that they think Matt Chapman should win this award again. And he's probably got some supporters out there. So what do you say, Riley? Does Matt Chapman win another gold glove this year? I would love to say it, man. Again, I don't have uh, J Ram's range factor ahead, uh, in <laughs> front of me, but I'm sure it is um, minuscule compared to Matt Chapman. And I think the case for Bragman is just steady defense will eventually win you the hardware. Again, Bragman's been in the league now for probably, you know, seven, six or seven years. I don't know if he's been nominated before. I don't think he's won a gold glove before, but, um, you know, Chapman is a guy who's, we're not going to say he's getting worse defensively, but the 14 errors, and I can recall a lot of those. A lot of those are throwing errors. A lot of those are throwing errors in their care, kind of careless errors. Um, and I've seen it a couple times where he'll make a great defensive play where if the ball gets by him or, or he kind of mishandles it, it's probably going to be recorded as a hit. Um, and he ends up just throwing the ball away. Um, so he might have kind of docked himself that way. But, I mean, hey, uh, again, if he doesn't win – it's like not the end of the world, but I think for a guy like Matt Chapman, who I think got snubbed last year, um, I would call it less of a snub this year. But still, if if they're going to look and you see Gold Glove and Matt Chapman written on a ballot somewhere, I mean, he's always up for conversation to win that award at third base. Yep. I don't know if he's going to win six throwing errors and six fielding errors, Riley. He had exactly one in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So just because I think he's taken a big step down in that thing, even though errors don't tell the whole picture, we know. But I do think Matt Chapman might be on the outside looking in from his gold glove here. Uh, let's go on to the other three, Riley. Dalton Varsho. Um, is nominated for left field, although he kind of split his time between left field and center field. And Riley, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Dalton Varsho's winning this award. It was not even close. Um, he had 11 defensive run saves in left field, but if you add on his time in center field, he had another 18, Riley. That's 29 defensive run saves. It is not even close to who is better as a defensive outfielder. Um, I think Stephen Kwan, look, and Austin Hayes had great defensive seasons. This is Dalton Varsho's award, plain and simple. I mean, yeah, it's not even close. I mean, your face left fielder is a hitter's position. I think it's I think I said this last week, not to you, but in baseball, when I was on a baseball diamond playing left field and I said or thought to myself, this is the easiest position to play in baseball. <laughs> and I think I did say that to you, Jesse. That's you ringing a bell as you laugh. Um, but Dalton Varsho was the elite of the elitist. This is what happens. You have a center fielder playing left field. This is exactly the outcome of what you're going to get. Hayes, I, the only thing I can remember about Hayes is he made one hell of a catch. Um, I, I can't remember exactly the situation. He's made some good catches this year. And Stephen Kwan, can't say I've seen a lot of Stephen Kwan highlights. I'm sure he's a very steady and reliable left fielder, but no one is touching Dalton Varsho on this one. Like I said, this is what happens when you have a center fielder playing one of the corner fields. And how about our actual center fielder here, Riley? Kevin Kiermeyer. He is up against Julio Rodriguez of the Mariners and Luis Robert Jr. of the Chicago White Sox. Kevin Kiermeyer, known standout defensive center fielder. We brought him over here to play center field, to be a defensive whiz, and I'd say it worked just fine. Riley, you and I saw a lot this year, some of the great defensive catches that Kevin Kiermeyer made. Some of them were amazing, robbing home runs at the wall, making diving grabs. Honestly, a few where he just runs in and doesn't need to make a great play because he's already under the baseball, and that's how good he is. Second in defensive war behind only, Dalton Varsho. UZR has Kevin Kiermeyer fifth. And his five outfielder assists, Riley, were third best at the position, too, and um, which surprised me a little bit for Kevin Kiermeyer's arm. So um, very good stuff there. Riley, is he winning the award again this year? 
Uh, would be cool to see that. I think Julio had a really good year in center field as well. And I'm sure Robert has some very good defensive stats as well. It would be fairly funny if Kiermaier won this award. As we know, he definitely stole some gold gloves from um, Kevin Pillar. Mm-hmm. So uh, for him to win one in a Jays uniform, I think would be, you know, I, I, I don't even know if you'd call it poetic. It might even be the opposite of, of poetic because he's doing it with both American League East clubs there. But um, I think I think it's going to be t- tight if he can show these young whippersnappers that he's still got it and Robert and Rodriguez. But again, um, they're two young guys who both had good defensive years as well. So, I mean, I guess we'll see as far as that one goes. Wouldn't surprise me if he won. But again, Rodriguez is, in thinking in my head, I think Julio Rodriguez has a really good shot as well. Yeah, in terms of fielding run value, Kevin Kiermaier, best in the American League. So, I mean, hey, the stats back it up. The eye test backs it up. The reputation backs it up. I like to think Kevin Kiermaier gets one here as well, but they might throw out a legacy vote to Luis Robert or Julio Rodriguez. We'll see. And the last Blue Jay on this list, Riley, and I don't know how you can judge pitcher defense. I find it kind of tough sometimes. It's obvious with guys like Mark Burley, who you just look at them and you're like, yeah. This guy was good. Um, Marcus Stroman won a gold glove as a Blue Jay for a pitcher. And R.A. Dickey has also won a gold glove as a Blue Jays pitcher. I'm shouting out you Immaculate Grid fans. If you need some Blue Jays uh, gold glove award winners, there's a few for you. Um, But the defensive stats, tough to find. He did have a five defensive run save, which was the best of his career this year. And he had a lot of assists and put out of his career as well. So I think a lot of those running to first base to cover the bag for when Vladdy has to range out to his range and also getting the ball and throwing it to second to start some double plays. Definitely a couple of things. I remember Jose Brios doing well this year. And I, I don't know if he's going to win. Honestly, I don't know how good Sonny Gray or Pablo Lopez were, but I just don't think this is going to be Jose Brios award. I mean, there's two plays you got to be. I, not that I'm a pitcher. I think I've made that claim at least 40 times on this yeah. pod now. But there's two plays you got to make as a pitcher. The dribbler that, or the bunt that comes off the bat down the third baseline to be able to pick that ball up and throw to first base accurately. And then when the first baseman comes in to field a ball, you have to be able to go and cover first base. I think those are the really th- the two most complicated plays defensively you have to make as a pitcher. And in my head, you know, I'm thinking actually, you know, Kikuchi just stepped in front of that actually with his yeah. fielding balls to the third base side. He does a very good job at that. But as far as Barrios goes, I know for a fact that he can come off that mound um, very agilely and make his way to first and make the play um, at first base for the put out there um, after, you know, Vladdy or whoever's playing first fields the ball. So, yeah, it's a weird, pitchers are weird. A gold glove for a pitcher is even weirder. Um, so if Barrios wins, fantastic. If not, I mean, good for old man Sonny Gray or Pablo Lopez with his new team. Whatever. Again, it's a it's the Gold Glove Award. I'm, Jesse, I'm glad we did this, but that's how I feel about, um, <laughs> you know, Gold Glove. It's, that's what I feel about Gold Gloves. And, yeah, I love doing Gold Gloves on Immaculate Grid. Too bad. I'll throw it a name where I think they should have won a Gold Glove, and they didn't. Rem- uh, but, yeah, that's just that's just the story there. I'm just looking at these three names, Jose Barrios, Pablo Lopez, Sonny Gray all either current or former Minnesota twins. And I'm just imagining their PFP in spring training must be tough if their pitchers are this good defensively, but story for another day. Um, some other minor news and notes that have caught my attention this week in the off season and some stuff on the coaching side is that um, there is some interest in Blue Jays first base coach, Mark Budzinski to fill some managerial jobs, including um, in Cleveland and the New York Mets. If he does stay in Toronto, it seems likely he will pl- replace Luis Rivera and move over to the third base spot. Blue Jays assistant general manager, James Click is getting a lot of interest from the Boston Red Sox for their general manager job. So we'll see, stay tuned there see what happens, especially now that it's been announced that Ross Atkins will be returning as RGM. And then Cito Gaston, Riley, a Blue Jays legend, has been um, one of eight names um, on the Baseball Hall of Fame's Contemporary Baseball Eric Committee ballot for the class of 2024. So it's like one of those things where the committee can decide if someone gets into the Hall of Fame this year. Some other names on the ballot, Riley, some names you might know, Davey Johnson, Lou Pinella, uh, Jim Leland, and Joe West. Um, Cito Gaston's got to get 75% of the vote or more to get in there. Riley, is he going to be a Hall of Famer come December 3rd? Give me, give me Cito and give me Leland and actually throw me Lou Pinella. Lou Pinella deserves it as well. Cito Gaston was the first manager 
uh, first African American manager to win the World Series. You're I correct. think that I think that goes so important with the game of baseball. And he's easily, if you're to ask anybody, well, maybe not younger fans, but if you're to ask an intelligent Blue Jays fan, who's the best manager in Blue Jays history? The answer is Cito Gaston. That is the answer. I don't know if that's, I know there are facts and there are opinions, but I think this is just factual. Cito Gaston deserves to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was absolutely fantastic with his players, and I've heard nothing but good things out of the man's mouth. Two two consecutive World Series championships with our Jays, and yeah, for the and for what it's worth, yeah, give me Lou Pinella and give me uh, Jim Leland as well. Jim Leland, my favorite manager of all time, and Lou Pinella, great highlight reel. Um, I'm sure that we've all seen uh, his videos. Those caps took a lot of beatings over the years. Fun names in the baseball history book there. I think Cito Gaston will get in as well. He's already in the Blue Jays level of excellence. He's a winner. And uh, I can't think about Cito Gaston, Riley, without looking back to his playing career. And he has one of the most interesting careers, I think, ever. He came into the league in 67. He had a negative 0.6 war. Followed that up with a negative 0.6 war again. Then in 1970, Riley, he had 29 home runs. He had 318, 364, a 144 WRC plus, had a five war season and never finished in the positives yet again. He was a below war player. Every year of his career, except one in 1970 when he was almost a six win player. I think that's amazing from Cito Gaston. And just uh, if you're a baseball nerd like I am looking through that, a lot of fun. And I hope he does get into the Hall of Fame. What? Oh, go ahead. Riley. We're, we're, so we got Padres and Braves on there for Cito. What was another club he played for? Started with Atlanta, went to this Padres and then back to Atlanta. Oh, so he only played for two teams. OK, mm -hmm. I was thinking. I was thinking there was a didn't know if he played for the Cubs for a minute or whatever, but yeah, Cito Gaston, um, positive wins above replacement in the managerial side of things. Yes, absolutely, forget whatever he did as a player, it does not matter. He and will be. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, and I'm sure he will get there. And then one more bit of notes before we move on to the grading of our Blue Jays player is that the Blue Jays are doing renovations at the Rogers Center, which you might know. And a picture had surfaced online about a lot of the blue seats in the 100 level being thrown to a scrapyard on the Don Mills area. And some of um, our friends over at Gate 14 did some research, and they saw that um, they actually had strict orders from the Blue Jays to demolish them. So you cannot go and get a seat from the Rogers Center if you wanted to. And Riley, my question to you is um, the Blue Jays have a lot of history in that Rogers Center, right? Delgado Auto's four home run game, the World Series titles, the uh, Jose Bautista bat flip, the Encarnacion walk off home run. If you had an option to get one of the old seats from the Rogers Center, would you do it? I mean, maybe not. Maybe one of the TD comfort level ones, just because sure. they're comfy chairs. <laughs> um, I mean, hey, um, there's a red seat in Fenway that says this is where Ted Williams hit this baseball. There's a seat. And in ballparks all over that say this yeah. is the seat where this ball landed or whatever. Colorado Jays, has one where it's like this is exactly one mile above sea level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to say for Colorado for a home run two miles away from the stadium. Um, <laughs> like um, I don't I don't really care um, necessarily about the seats are cool. Um, I feel good about the people who got who tore up a piece of wood off of exhibition stadium bleachers or wherever those were that was the real deal at the time um i don't find our seats extremely iconic and maybe that's because i go up and sit in in the 500s and i look around and there's spilt popcorn and beer sure. cans yeah. everywhere um but hey i mean it, that's funny that they told them to demolish them so people couldn't take home the the you know people weren't going and fighting junkyard dogs to go get a uh, a, a free blue jay seat i mean because hey that would intrigue a lot of people all right riley with that being said let's get out our report cards riley and um we are going to hand out grades to all six toronto blue jay starting pitchers who made an appearance most of the offensive players that played a significant role this season and one or two guys in the bullpen we'll see how much time we have to get out there. Riley, I wanted to set this grade system up. So obviously I think if you put them at a B, they were good. They probably slightly exceeded expectations, maybe a C plus or a B minus as they met my expectations. Exactly. C is slightly worse. D is they were quite terrible. And F is the Alec Manoa tier. Uh, we'll save that for that. And then anything a or a better is these guys were great. They 
way exceeded my expectations. I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't even know this was even possible. And uh, we can be loose with this one. No one's going to come back and judge us on our report card skills here. But that's kind of the template I want to keep this at. So do you follow me? Yeah, no, this, this this sounds great. I am ready to go on on this one because I've already in my head, like I said, I know where I stand with many of these players, Jesse. All right, well, let's get to it. And let's start at the top of the starting rotation with Mr. Kevin Gosman. He went 185 innings pitched to a 316 ERA and a 5.3 war. Riley, what is your grade for Mr. Kevin Gosman this season? I mean, for me... This isn't an A plus by any means, but this is the next closest thing for Kevin Gosman. I'm going to give him an A, and a yeah, lot and a lot season. of that comes from there was there was some times where he didn't have his best stuff, but it was few and far between. The amount of strikeouts this guy racked up was amazing. He's going to be when they talk. We'll be talking about when they do the Cy Young nominations. I don't think he's going to win the uh, win the award. Sadly but he will certainly be nominated. Kevin Gosman had a fantastic year. One of the easiest grades I'll hand out all day. It's just an A. A plus would have been, tw- A plus for me is 20 win season. Not that wins matter. 300 K- Ks for like Gosman. I mean, to exceed expectations, I had a high bar going in with Gosman. He gets an A from me. He is slightly exceeded expectations. He's just the ace you want on this ball club. Yeah, he was good. He wasn't, there were times where he didn't feel as dominant as you'd want Kevin Gosman to feel or as your A should be. Remember, he did give up some runs in the playoffs as well, but I gave him an A at the end of the season, Riley. Ultimately, he set the Blue Jays franchise record in strikeouts to walk ratio and Ks per nine. Like if you do that in a season, you're, it's an A, it can't be any worse than that. So A for ace Kevin Gosman. Um, let's move on to our next one, Riley. Jose Barrios ended the season with 189 innings pitch, 365 ERA, and a three-war season, Riley. Give us your grade on Mr. Jose Barrios. This is a feel-good story. I don't know what I gave him last year. If I gave him an F, I apologize. If I gave him a <laughs> D, that's probably rightfully deserved. But I'm going to grade this, Jesse, like I just failed his last test and now I'm a teacher who gets Jose Brios's test and I look at the answers and I go this guy did his homework this guy's showing mm-hmm. up to class this guy deserves a high mark unfortunately it wasn't you know uh, the, the best of best seasons but for Jose Brios and what he did this year for Jose Brios and how he bounced back if I'm a teacher and I want to motivate a student after how much they improved in a year Give him Barrios an A minus. That might seem like a high grade. I'm going off of it, how much he vastly improved and how much he actually impacted this ball club. He gets an A minus for me, Jesse. Yeah, I did not have Jose Barrios starting our um, second playoff game coming into the season, but he was very good. Riley, I was impressed. Um, the K per nine jumped up, the walks per nine went down, and most importantly, Riley, the home run numbers went down for Jose Barrios this year. I settled on a B plus. I was impressed. I still look. I, I his X ERA was closer to four point five, much than to the three six five ERA. So. I'll take the over, I guess, on this ERA coming into next season. But for strictly what he did for this team this year, I'm giving him a B plus. Couldn't, uh, yeah, it was, it was either, it was either B plus or A minus. Jesse, yep, love that. To our next pitcher, Chris Bassett. It was his first year in Toronto, Riley, and he was able to hit the 200 innings pitch mark. Pitched to a 3.60 ERA and a 2.6 WAR. I love the velocity went up and all that good stuff. It was a really good season for Chris Bassett in his first year with the Toronto Blue Jays. What's your grade, Riley? I'm going to go back to the same grade. I'm going to give him an A minus, and mm. I will tell High you grades what, for our pitchers. I, I, what, they deserve it. And the next guy you're going to give me deserves it too. Chris right. Bassett is like fine wine right now. He's aging so well. He had his best year of his career. You know, he played for played for Oakland for a while, and then goes over to the Mets. Has a, his best year with the Mets. Comes to Toronto and he has his best year of his career with the Blue Jays. And he's a workhorse, man. We got him to 200 innings. Again, it's one of those things where I'm adding in the fact where my expectations are are involved in this. This For me, this is an exam. This isn't a true or false A, B, C, D. This is the baseball year is too too long and, and, and too, you know, connected to just have kind of like your – 
true, your true or false or whatever. This is an exam. You got to grade it like an exam. So that's where you can kind of, some things are up for discussion. And for me, for Chris Bassett, what I'm looking at is how he's going to be his age 33, 34 season, whatever. He had his, the best year of his career. He's throwing 200 innings at his age. And again, He's sub four ERA. He's helping us win ball games, and he deserved more. He deserved more wins, and he already had the most wins in the AL. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, A minus is the grade that I gave Chris Bassett here as well. Um, he did have a few blowups here or there, but I think Riley coming into the season, what we thought of Chris Bassett was, yeah, he's going to have about three or four blowups, and he's going to look really darn good the rest of the way, and that's pretty much exactly what happened. Um, He was the soft exit velocity king. And although he didn't lead baseball in minimum exit velocity this year, he was fourth best on the Blue Jays and he was the Blue Jays best starter at suppressing hard contact. So good stuff from Chris Bassett. A A minus for me. I'm looking forward to see what you can do next season. Riley, you kind of teased it a little. You said you had high grades coming for this next pitcher. And that is my guy, Yusei Kikuchi, Riley. What is your grade on his season? I believe um, that... (laughs) I knowing how I'm going to grade later into this episode and how good those four pick those four guys played this year. Um, And you just gave me four exams in a row that are uniquely different, but, you know, kind of, you know, tickle by fancy in the way Mm. of baseball. And we know something Jesse from last episode, because you teach me things about weird baseball numbers. (laughs) And one of those is strikeouts per nine innings. And, you say Kikuchi had the best strikeouts per nine as a left-handed pitcher. I was going to give this guy a B plus yep. based off his improvement. He had from last year. It's the same title as Barrios gets. I'm given you say Kikuchi an a minus and he absolutely deserves it. Yeah. He went Riley from leading all of spring. No, sorry. Let's flash back. He went from being literally the worst pitcher in all of baseball last year to getting demoted to the bullpen to coming into spring training this year with a beard, Remember all this, a bearded Kikuchi and was taking the rage everywhere. He went to getting uh, more strikeouts than any other pitcher in spring training, added a curveball this year that he hadn't thrown since his rookie season, cut his walk rate in half, went from 5.19 per nine to 2.58. He did still give up a lot of home runs. There was still some hard contact, and there were times where Yusei Kikuchi would flash in consistency. But overall, man, fantastic season. I'm giving him a B plus. Good. Not great, but definitely exceeded our expectations. He can be happy to put that one on the fridge at home for Mr. Yusei Kikuchi. Um, Riley, next pitcher on our list, Alec Manoa. And uh, 87.1 innings pitch, 5.87 ERA, and a negative .04 war. I think we can both say pretty profoundly here that this is an F for Alec Manoa this year. This was an absolute failure of a year for Alec Manoa. This is probably the only F that is... Um, this is the biggest F in major league baseball this year for, for any, for any player. Um, absolutely deserves the grade. It sucks. I hope he's able to bounce back from whatever is going on. Um, but yeah, this, this was an atrocious year for, for Alec Manoa. Did, I, we were all absolutely blindsided that this happened. I think that also goes into the grade we give him. It's not like we expected uh, you know, a 5.6 ERA or anything like that. We we had high hopes for this guy, and he fell so far below them. It's 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 got to be an F, Jesse. Literally went from top three in Cy Young and a 4.5 WAR season to literally the worst pitcher in baseball. Um, we're gonna get more into Alec Noah in the off season as things go because he's actually gonna be a very interesting talking point. So stay tuned for him. Next pitcher is Hunjin Ryu. He went 52 innings pitch coming back from Tommy John surgery. Pitched to a 3-4-6 ERA and 0.4 war in just his 50 innings of pitch thrown. What's your grade for the Korean monster, Hun Jin Ryu? So let's, I know he only, you know, it's not a sample size. He came back from injury. So how are you going to do after Tommy John surgery? He did pretty good. I'm going to give him a solid grade for what, for what, when he was put into the ball game, because I'm not going to dock him for, you know, less than 100 innings pitched or whatever. I'm going to give him a B. Yeah, I think he did a. I think he did a fine job. I think. I think had he pitched this whole year, it could have been a lower grade. I don't know when Ryu's wheels are going to fall off, but Father Time is sneaking up on him. And Jesse, I think the biggest thing with him is if he doesn't locate his pitches, 
they go bye bye. Like yes. he will get <laughs> he will get destroyed if he doesn't locate those those pitches. That's it's a very dangerous thing, and it's it's very scary when Hunjin Ryu takes the mound. He's very good when he is on, but very bad when he is not. Yep, basically the same thing. I was pleasantly surprised. I thought Hunjin Ryu was just cooked. I thought he didn't have anything left in him. He showed in the stretch of the second half that he still has some life in him. I don't think the Blue Jays are going to re-sign him, but I will say, especially if this is Hunjin Ryu's last breath as a Toronto Blue Jay, um, I do want to say thank you. And that Hunjin Ryu signing was the first big signing that the Blue Jays made to show they are ready to compete. My grade, Riley, B, solid B. He was good, as expected. Didn't wow me, didn't go anything crazy, but I liked what I saw. Um, Riley, on to the offensive side, and let's start behind the plate with a man we already talked about this episode. And let's go Alejandro Kirk. He hit 250, 334, 358 with eight home runs and a 1.6 war. Defense was amazing. The bat and base running were terrible. So uh, what is your grade for Alejandro Kirk behind the dish? I wish I could. So in my head, I'm trying to average this out because you really have to put into consideration the different areas of baseball because his defense is so good. I've been so hard on Kirk. I'm going to give Kirk a I'm going to give Kirk a B minus. Okay. And it's only because his defense really saved him cuz yeah, I'm not even I'm not even going to talk about base running with him. I I thought his his hitting obviously should have been a lot better. Um I think this is this might be part of the course of what we get with Alejandro Kirk from here on. Um this kind of year, the 250 average is obviously we he can get bad on ball, but again, it's a quality over quantity thing. I mean, he has great plate vision, but doesn't always square the ball up. And of course, the power seems to disappear at some points, but it's a B minus for me. Defense really kept him in that B grade. Yeah, I ended up with a C plus on Alejandro Kirk, and it was mostly because um, the defense actually brought this up. But there were times this year, Riley, we talked about it late in the season where just the base running was so bad. He couldn't even finish games like you needed to run for Alejandro Kirk. And the power just seemed to lose it. He couldn't drive anything with authority. It was all just soft contact, soft contact. The fact he got to eight home runs, I think, is actually pretty wild from watching Alejandro Kirk all this year. If we could just find the guy who had a six-week tear at the middle of last summer where he really went on and he won a silver slugger, that would be huge for this team. But I'm not certain um, we're going to get it. I'm getting real Jose Molina vibes for uh, Alejandro Kirk as he's going to finish up his career there. And uh, just want to throw that name out there. Well, yeah, actually, I think Jose, if you were to race all the Molinas, I think Yachty wins the race. Jose finishes second. But I think Benji Molina is the slowest Molina brother. And where would you fit Kirk in there? In the race of the Molinas? Oh, man. He might might be slower than Yachty, faster than Jose. Okay, wow. That would be a race I I would love to see. Yeah, that's just like the presidents all racing in uh, in (laughs) Washington there. And let's put um, just a random fan in there for reference and see how it goes. I think that would be a lot of fun. Or uh, Corbin or Corbin Carroll in a fat sure. suit and, and still crush <laughs> all of them. That'd be great. Love to see it. There's your idea, Blue Jays. If you're looking for some in-inning entertainment, we've got it for you right there. Um, to our next catcher, that is Danny. Danny Barrels, as I'm calling him. Danny Jansen finished the season hitting 228, 312, 474 with 17 home runs and a 116 WRC plus two war in only 86 games for Danny barrels. Riley, we're Danny Jansen fans on this podcast. What was your grade? You ended with it. I would love to give him an a, I can't, I got to give him a B plus, you know, I love my Danny Jansen. I think it is criminal that this guy has never played a full season of baseball. Holy cow. Can you say 30 home run club? This is one of the best power hitting catchers in baseball. Ball, and no one bats an eyelash at this guy. I feel like he is so underrated, underappreciated that I, I mean, I want him to bounce back in a big way next year. Like, I, and I'm sure he will. I have all all the faith in the world that he does. Again, I, I really can't give him an. I really can't give him an A. I'm. I and it sucks um, because. I mean, he doesn't have a full-time job. I feel like I would be, you know, he definitely gets a better grade than Kirk. Um, but, you know, it just sucks with how injury prone he's been and playing behind guys. Because like I said before, if Kirk, if Kirk is our guy for the future and we end up parting ways with Danny Jansen, if he goes off somewhere in a different part of his career, that won't be me being salty. I will be so freaking happy for Danny Jansen because he deserves okay. nothing more than a starting role into hit cleanup 
for a bad team and possibly make them good. That'd be awesome. Um, I'm actually in the camp that I want the Blue Jays to extend Danny Jansen. I tweeted that out earlier this week, and I think that could be a very underrated talking point this season, this off season. Um, Riley, my grade was a B plus for Danny Jansen, and I'm gonna. I could have. I wanted to raise it more just because I see the offensive power he does. There were times when Danny Jansen single handedly was the. Oh, seemed like the only one who could hit on this team. Um, but they always say the best ability is availability, and Danny Jansen only played 86 games this year. Again, I would love to rank that higher, but I just can't until we get him on the field a little more. Yep, that's it. Hey, Jesse, we just basically same same boat for Jansen. We yep. went. I hope he has a good off season. He come back. He comes back so strong and healthy next year, and just rolls with not being streaky and just is who he is the whole time. All right, Riley, this next player is going to be a little interesting, and it is Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who on the season hit 264, 345, 444 with 26 home runs, a 118 WRC+, and only one war on the season. We talked about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. a lot, as a lot of Blue Jays fans talked about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. a lot. Still a good year, but a year that kind of felt disappointing from what was supposed to be our best hitter and a guy who could have the talent to win MVP again. So what is your grade on Vladimir Guerrero Jr.? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, you know, Isaac isn't with us right now, Mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to give, add some of his, you know, um, kind of judgment into mine because I think I'm going to go C plus. I'm going to be different. I don't, whether it's deserved or not, um, I think we have to go expect, I'm throwing, you know, it was a good year. It was a good year, but one war at first base, you know, he was not who he could have been. So we're going to call this, if we're grading it, this is this kind of this guy who should get straight A's and he was lackadaisical on, on, you know, whatever kind of schooling assignment this was. So, I mean, I got to stick him with a C plus because it's certainly not his best work. We expect more out of him. And will we get that again? Geez, I hope so, man. I um, thought he did well defensively. Um, absolutely made me want to rip my hair out on the base paths. <laughs> um, and he was completely average as far as first baseman go in the hitting category. And 26 home runs. That's, I mean, I thought, you know, double that would have been fantastic. But uh, we obviously, we got, we got what we got. I'm giving him a C+. Plus. This to me kind of feels like, um, all right, this kid was a talented kid. He's coming up through school. He's getting praise for how special and smart. He's winning all these awards for how smart he is at a young age. Then he gets to high school and he goes through there and he starts acting out a little bit. He tries to discover who he is and, you know, he hangs out with the wrong crowd a little bit. Next thing you know, his grades start to slip a little bit. And, you know, you know, this guy can be really smart if he just tried and really put all his effort into it. And that's kind of how I picture Vladimir Guerrero Jr. in the baseball sense here. I gave him a B minus Riley. Um, the talent is insane. You know, it's in there. You know, he has the A plus potential. You know, he could win multiple MVPs. Um, it's just, I saw some things this year in Vladimir Guerrero's swing, whether that was from the coaches or whether that was from other people. Like he missed, swung and missed at three straight fastballs in the same at bat once this year. He had never done that in his career. His exit velocity numbers are still elite, but they are moving down across the board. I didn't love this from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And I'm really hoping we see a better thing next year. B minus is my grade for Guerrero. First of all, you with the whole high school story there, that hit way too close to home. <laughs> Holy jeez, to get out of my head. Uh, second of all, yeah, it's, it, again, oh, Jesse, we haven't jumped the whole grade ahead of each other. We've been pretty close one after the other. That's, that's, good, that's good that we're on the same page. All right, um, let, let us know in the yeah, comments below, good. though, what you guys think about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and what his grade should be, as well as all the other grades for all the other players in this season. Um, oh, we've got him right so far. Oh, I think we've so, got too. Him, we've got him right so far. If there was someone grading our grades, mm, that'd be excellent. We'd be good on a that. Mi- a <laughs> minus. Perfect. Love that. All right. To the other first baseman slash DH that played on this team. And that was our new addition. That was Brandon Belt, who we got from San Francisco. His one year in Toronto, he hit 254, 369, 490 slugging, hit 19 home runs, and a 138 WRC+. plus. Ended up with a 2.3 war season. Riley, we came into the offseason needing some thump from the off offseason, or some thump from the left-handed side of the plate, and Brandon Belt was supposed to be our solution with that. What do you think? Did he achieve those expectations? Did he exceed it? What's your grade? I mean, I would be inclined to give this man a B. 
Okay. I mean, there was times where he felt like he was the best hitter on this team. That's, And then there was times where it felt like, get this guy out of the lineup. But I think for the most part, for what role he had to fill for this team, I, I think he did a fantastic job. Um, obviously, like the sl- the slugging jumps off the page to you. He definitely was an extra base hit monster. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had some timely home runs for us, man. I think Brandon Belt, who's already put together a great big league career, his first team other than his longtime squad, the Giants. You know, it's a that's a new, brand new thing for him. Brand new thing. He plays his whole career for one ball club. He comes to the opposite division, NL West, AL East. And this is what we got out of the guy first year. Uh, whether he's back with us or not, whatever. Um, I mean, he. I think he. I think he filled in a great spot and the most average grade I can give a guy like meeting my expectations. Whatever, I'm going to give him a B. Yeah, B plus, just because the WRC plus was so good. Brandon Belt looked um, fantastic at times, and uh, if this is the end of his major league playing career and he does choose to retire at the end of this, thank you for spending your last year um, with the Blue Jays with us. And um, it's just the 0 for 8 in the playoffs, Riley, does sting a little from Brandon Belt. Um, so maybe that's biasing the grade a little bit, but yeah, defensive limitations too. I think B plus is right where I'm going to end on that one. Moving over to, I guess, our positional players or more ones that can be more versatile. We'll go to Whit Merrifield, who was our big trade deadline acquisition last year at the trade deadline. He hit 272, 318, 382 this season, a 93 WRC plus 1.5 war. You could say, Riley, positional versatility was good. 84 games at second base, another 81 in left field, plus six in right field for Whit Merrifield. What is your grave for Mr. Whit? I mean, hey, at times, hey, if he, if you took a small sample size, he could have the biggest. If you took one chunk and said, who has the best small size 10-day stretch, you could make an argument that an A-plus go to Davis Schneider and Whit Merrifield oh, sure. for a very short time. But for the rest of the year, Jesse... You know, even with the defensive versatility and the base running, I got to give him a C plus because the wheels just started to fall off at the end of the year. And it's 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 kind of like, OK, we have too many other options than to put Whit Merrifield in the lineup today. Like when you become an option off the bench from what you were supposed to be. You know, then, you know, then we got to consider lowering this grade. So for me, Whit Merrifield at times, oh, yeah, it was on an absolute tear there for a minute. But let's go back and look at his numbers the whole year. I think it's a C plus. Yeah, I'm with you, Riley. Um, It was kind of just meh for most of the year. And then the month of July, he had uh, seven home runs. Seven of his 11 home runs came in the month of July. And then for the rest of the season, he was just... Kind of meh. WRC plus is at or below 100 through every single one of those, um, every single one of those months. So yeah, C for Whit Merrifield. He's getting old. Um, he did some good things for us. He helped you do a small ball. You know, he was a good defender in left field. But I think I'm ready to see Whit Merrifield go. And thank you for your time here with the Toronto Blue Jays. Hey, he was a great. He was a great piece for us. Um, I was a good acquisition. Uh, at the time but of course like things don't last forever in the game of baseball and i think his time with us is more than likely over all right moving on to another player that played a similar role to whit merrifield and that is kevin biggio he hit 235 340 370 on the season 103 wrc plus one war but he really did come on late pulling up his splits here from the first half and second half he hit um, yeah 197 in the first half with on, with seven home runs, and then he hit 272 and really changed his approach in the second half, hit more doubles and all that stuff. The versatility was key for him. Uh, 49 games at second, 27 at right, 20 at first, 13 at third, DH seven times, and also played one game at shortstop for Kevin Biggio. So I'd love to hear what is your grade on Biggio going into the offseason? Give me a... B minus for Kevin Biggio. I love the versatility. I he's hey at times was a painful player to watch, but he came along fine uh, towards the end of the year. And I think he's a player I'm really looking forward to watch this year. And I hope the Blue Jays really insert him into an everyday player next year. I think he's. I don't. No one's ever. He was. I felt like Kevin was given, you know, maybe a little too much at the start of his career. And he did start his big league career off pretty good. But as far as, you know, I think this was a, the season Kevin needed 
to kind of resurrect things for himself and his career. It's a B minus for me. Of course, you would love to see numbers increase all over the board, especially in the on base department, which he was supposed to be so good. But his defense everywhere is fantastic. And he had some pretty big home runs for us as well. I feel like Kevin is also a clutch hitter and uh, it still takes really good plate appearances and approaches the ball really well. Uh, you know, and I'm excited. I want this guy in the everyday lineup next year. I'm excited to see what he can do. B minus for me. Yeah, I'm going to give him a B plus. I'm encouraged, not thrilled, but encouraged about his second half he put together. Um, he really just he started to swing down on the ball a little more. Because, look, he's never been the type of guy who hits the ball super hard. He does always profile as a fly ball hitter. But just changing his swing and leveling it out a little more has led to great results. And I'd love to see that over the course of a full season. It does sound like, I've been thinking about the offseason a little bit, that no matter what the Blue Jays do this offseason, it does sound like Kevin Biggio is going to be an everyday player, especially against righties. He's going to play every against every single righty. Whether it's in left field, whether it's at second base, whether it's at third base, wherever it may be, Biggio is going to be in the lineup every day going into next season. And I think for once, Blue Jays fans seem positive about that. And I think that's pretty good. I want him at third base. I'm very optimistic for next year. I think he'll do a fine job. All right. We'll get into that later in this offseason. The next one who played a middle infield role is Santiago Espinal was an all-star in t- the year prior. Not so much this year. Hit 248, 310, 355 um, with only two home runs, 80 WRC plus and a 0.1 war. 47 games at second, another 26 at third, 16 at short, and even DH'd a game did Santiago Espinal. Um, what's your grade on this guy? I mean, are we gonna are we gonna say that because this guy was an all I'm gonna hold this guy. I will. I'll be this guy. I'm gonna hold him accountable because he was an all-star last year. Um, I'm gonna give him a C minus. Um, there was a big fight over who's on second. I could tell you one thing, it ain't Espinal. We gotta look somewhere else. Um, the, another guy who the power just kind of disappeared from, um, doesn't overly flash me defensively and, you know, Hey, you know what? He had a big hit. I, what did he do? He, he topped the ball up the third baseline. Yeah. Um, it, what might've been his biggest hit of the year. I mean, I know he had a double as well in one of the games. He laced one down the line, but still there are, weren't a whole lot of moments where you went, wow, look at what Espinal did this year. I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to give him a C minus, Jesse. I th- I don't know if that's too tough, but I mean, if we're handing out grades at second base, he's going to get m- maybe the lowest grade out of anybody. Yeah, I gave him a D plus to the base running and defense, which is kind of the role he was supposed to play on this team, did take a step back this season. And when you're only hitting two home runs, it's tough. Look, the Blue Jays don't make that run in the last half of 2021 without Santiago Espinal. So thank you for that. Thank you for the good first half, which made you an all-star the year before. But I think his time as a Toronto Blue Jay is done. I think it might be tough for him to survive a roster crunch going into this offseason. And uh, yeah, I think we're better off giving his roster spot to one of the younger players and seeing what they can do this year. D plus for Santiago Espinal. Um, We're going to have to move through these next ones with some pace, but we got to talk Bo Bichette, Riley, who many people said, including some of our pitchers on our staff, was the Blue Jays' best hitter this year. And I want to see if you agree. He hit 306, 339, 475 with 20 home runs. Also added a bunch of stolen bases here as well. Um, 125 WRC plus and a 3.8 war. 130 games at shortstop, five more at designated hitter. What is your role or grade for Bo Bichette this year? I'm going to, you want it to be short and sweet? It's an A. Boba yeah. Shek gets an A. I'm, I feel bad that he got injured. I really thought he'd get to that 200 hit mark and lead the American League in hits again. Whatever. He'll do it next year. Don't care. He gets an A. Defense has gotten a heck of a lot better. That's the and big what one. He, That's huge. And what he can do at the plate it still is phenomenal. So it's, it's an easy one. There is no question Bo was our best hitter this year. Got his strikeouts too. His walks were still low, yes, but he was just spraying opposite hit machine. Um, very impressed with Bobachet. I'm giving him an A as well, especially because the leaps he made on defense. Um, I'm glad he got his money, and I'm glad we have him under here for uh, two more years. Riley, Matthew Chapman, and let me pull up his stats here, but as you give up your grave, I know this is a tough one. Started off the year insanely hot and kind of cooled off. We already talked about his defense a little bit here, but what is your grade on Matt Chapman this year? Oh man. Okay. I, I gotta give him a D plus. D I plus. gotta give it, I got, I gotta give him a D plus. The defense is obviously great, but I mean, I expected so much more and I mean, Hey, I mean, this is a guy 
who should have had, should have, could have, would have. For me, he's a 30 home run guy. He doesn't strike out as much as he did. I mean, he was taking some of the worst swings in baseball. Not that they weren't bad swings, but he just couldn't find the baseball to save his life when they should have been labeled and hit 430 feet into the bleachers. Um, and yeah, I guess you can make an argument. 14 airs, too. Um, wasn't his best year defensively. He still is great defensively, but I mean, at the end of the day, he had he was a player of the month and then was below average by more than a little bit the rest of the year. Yeah, I'm giving him a C. I think a C is what I settled on here. Um, but yeah, I've never seen a hitter swing and miss at more fastballs right down the middle or look at <laughs> obvious pitches he should hit or hit fine numbing pop ups that I saw Matt Chapman hit down the stretch this year. Look. It was a great trade to make. You make that trade if you're the Toronto Blue Jays every single time. We'll talk about what to do with him in the offseason, probably on our next episode when we get into that. But yeah, see, we needed more thump. And I think part of the reason our offense struggled as a whole is because Matt Chapman struggled as a whole this season. And um, kind of tough. I think I'm going to settle as a C for him there. Yeah, I have no complaints there. I guess, I guess we... Uh, go over to left field, I suppose, don't we, Jesse? Well, before we go to left field, one more infielder we got to oh, talk about. And this guy sure, came up late, sure. late into the year. It's Davis Schneider, who only played in 35 games for the Toronto Blue Jays, but I thought he left enough of an impact. We had to talk about him here. 276, 404, 603, 176 WRC plus, and a two war in his a short time in there. 23 games at second base, played three and left, three at third, and DH for another seven. He was insanely hot, Riley, the best player in baseball for a good stretch, and then cooled off dramatically with the strikeouts being quite high. Um, seeing how we didn't really know who this guy really was, he wasn't super high on prospect list coming into the season. I think we got to give him a good grade, but I'll leave that to you. What are we giving Davis Schneider? Oh, I'm certainly giving him a great grade. I think an A minus is a great grade. I think it could have been an A. Yeah, sure. Uh, he's obviously bound to cool down, but from being a 20 whatever pick um, and to a big league superstar, basically the best player to start a big league career. I mean, that doesn't go without saying. But um, yeah, with with the strikeouts going up and then kind of averaging out. I mean, there's still a spike in his statistics because of how great he started. So I'm going to give him an A minus. I could, you know, possibly be persuaded to an A, but um, again, it goes with sample size. It goes with, uh, um, you know, the hot and cold kind of aspect to his game. I think A minus is very fair uh, for what he did. Yeah, B plus for me on Davis Schneider. I really do hope with whatever happens this offseason that the Blue Jays do give Davis Schneider an extended run this year. I know the Blue Jays brass were concerned about the strikeouts. I'm not, man. I like, look, you let Matt Chapman in there who struck out a billion times this season. Let Davis Schneider go in there and at least he's going to drive the ball a little better for you. I want to see more of him in our lineup next year. Um, now we can go to left field, Riley, and that is with Dalton Varsho with his first year in the American League and with the Toronto Blue Jays. Hit 220. 285, 389, only an 85 WRC plus at the plate, 2.1 more, but the defense was incredible. We've already said earlier this episode he's going to win a gold glove. 117 games in left field, another 64 in center with one game at designated hitter. Tough one to rank here, Riley. What is your grade for Dalton Varsho? I already talked about how good he is defensively, and I'm going to be a dink when I do this grading on Varsho because in my head, we did the gold gloves. When we first prepped for this episode, the gold gloves weren't in my head. That was something you, you, that was, that was Jesse programming, doing the thing. So in my grade, what I'm doing, my original Varsho grade was a D minus. I will throw that out there. I gave Dalton Varsho a D minus. I'm going to change it to a C minus because of his defensive. I was really only looking at the offensive side of the ball and I was so disappointed what he did offensively. That was terrible. We cannot have that same business, but Jesse, he's a shoe in that gold glove. He's a center fielder playing left field. Sure. I'll change my grade. I'm going to give Varsho a C minus, but let it be known that his hitting was very close to an F for me this year because I had him as a 30, 30 guy. If you listen or watch or show, you know that I had bold takes. I had him as 30, 30. He didn't even come close to that. So, I mean, I'm left with a C minus cause you probably put in, in a plus fielder. So sure. We'll call it a C minus. I'm going with a B minus here, Riley, based mostly on the defensive. Work. Holy um, cow. You know, look, it was a disappointment. Don't get me wrong. His first year in Toronto, we all expected more. I will say 
at the start of the season, a lot of people were giving Dalton Varsho some love saying like, hey, look, this guy's doing those little things well. This guy's doing the things the Blue Jays need. He's running first to third well. He's hitting the cutoff, man. His defense looks extreme. He got off to a good start. He then hit a lull, Riley, and I'm giving him a B minus based on the facts. I do think he is going to be a better hitter next year. He did get better in the month of September. He actually felt like, hey, maybe this guy can actually be a good playoff producer for us. I'm giving him a B minus here as like a vote of confidence. Maybe it's a gifty B, I suppose, but uh, a vote of confidence that he can be better in his next test going forward. So B minus for Dalton Varsho. I hope you get ripped in the comments for that one. <laughs> like, oh, he's a vote of confidence for next. We're marking him on how he did this year in 220. I guess. I 220 suppose. a 220 hitter and no and no teacher's books gets a B grade unless you have 45 home runs. How many did he hit this year? 20. Not, 20 on the nose. He needed 25 more home runs to mm. Anyways, let's go over to center field and let's talk about the other guy who's going to win a gold glove. Yeah, Kevin Kiermaier, a guy we saw a lot playing over in the Tampa Bay Rays, came over on a one-year deal his first year in Toronto, I think was a success. And we'll see if your grade agrees with me here. He hit 265, 322, 419, a positive WRC plus for the first time in years for Kevin Kiermaier. 2.2 war, 127 games, all in center field, Riley. What's your grade? B plus absolutely exceeded expectations at the plate. And he's a real fun guy to watch in center field, especially if he's on your side of the battlefield. Um, yeah, I did not know what we were going to get. I thought it'd be more of a mixed bag and I didn't think we'd get a lot out of him hit wise. Uh, I got more on the offensive side. And of course it seems like the defense has really not gone anywhere. His legs are still very much there. So B plus for me from Kevin Kiermeyer, heck of a year. Solid B for me. I think we got like the 80th percentile outcome for Kevin Kiermeyer. Very good season. We'll bank it. We'll take it. We'll cash it. Thank you, Kevin Kiermeyer. Fun to root for you. I'll miss your defense out in center field. B from him. Three players to go, Riley, and we are running out of time. So let's hammer through them here. George Springer, our guy in right field this year, he ended up hitting 258, 327, 405. The same WRC plus as Kevin Kiermeyer. 2.2 war with 21 home runs on the year. How do you grade George Springer? Ah. Uh. I think I got to give him a B minus. Um, I think his incredible year defensively as well, I will add. Um, I don't know where I had him at the start of the year. I'm sure I could add together a bunch of clips. I very, I feel very funny towards George Springer. I knew he was going to kind of step back. I think everyone kind of knew that. Uh, but I still think he played a lot of baseball games this year. He was really good for us in the leadoff spot. He was still an everyday player. He, at times, it feels like he subs, you know, went 0 for 5 way too often. Um, but the games that he did string together hit some three for five efforts or got on base four times in a ball game. I mean, he did that too. So a lot of hot and cold with it. But um, he's a he's a B minus for me for George Springer. Yeah, I'm going to go with a C plus. We did see a little bit of decline, but um, he was really mired by like an 0 for 45, I think somewhere in the middle of the season. You take that away, which I know you can't do, but if you do take that away, he still had a pretty good year. Look, he's getting older. I think we are seeing the decline of George Springer. More DH days are in his future coming up, but still solid contributor. Maybe his days is like counting on him to be a high impact thumper are probably gone, but this was fine. If this is what the decline looks like, this is a casual decline. I'll take it. C plus for George Springer. And uh, Riley, we won't have enough time to get into our bullpen like uh, like we really want to. But uh, we got to talk at least about our closer. And that is Jordan Romano, who some people thought he had an amazing season. Some people thought he had a terrible season. He ended up 59 innings to a 290 ERA, a 1.2 war and 36 saves on the season. What is your grade for Jordan Romano? I think I give Romano a C plus. At the end of the day, he's still a big league closer. But he he took us out of more ball games um, than he has in, in the, you know, the year prior to that. And I think that those are games that we have to win. We have to be locked down. When you question if your closer is your closer, there starts to become some very upset feelings in the stomach of fans and, and baseball people, because the closer is a for sure position and for a lot of teams. And it's, you almost want to hit the panic button when he's coming out for the eighth inning. Um, and when that was happening, it kind of, you know, that's, that's not a great feeling. And of course, you know, Romano had um, a very bad 
you know, kind of end of the season. Um, 36 saves is still pretty good as far as closers go. And a sub three ERA is also great, Jesse. But I had, you know, him basically keeping us in more ball games, less blown saves, things like that. So I think I said, I don't know if I said C or C plus, but I said, I'm going to say C. Yeah, I'm going to give him a B. This was solid. You know, the 36 saves do look nice. If you look at the individual metrics on some of his individual pitches, Riley, it does look like he was having some of the best uh, pitching season stuff-wise. But there's a stat I really like, and Fangrass has it. It's called shutdown and meltdowns. Riley, in 2022, 37 shutdowns, only 31 this year. But the big number is the meltdowns, Riley. 10 meltdowns for Jordan Romano this year, which is by far the most he's had in his career, which is never a sign you like to see from your closer. So um, I got a lot of takes on Jordan Romano, but I will save them for the next episode or into our offseason. And the last guy we got to grade, Riley, John Schneider, our manager. We talked about him a lot in the playoff collapse and everything there, but second year at the helm, his first full season, I suppose, at the helm. What's your grade for John Schneider? Oh, give this man, oh, geez, it's such a, it's such a tough thing to do because we got to go back now and say, now we were talking last episode, he said, she said, whose fault was it for pulling uh, our starter and this and that. At the end of the day, I'm going to give John Schneider a C because I don't believe that he had a lot to do with our wins and losses this year. Um, I think he made a couple good decisions. He also made a couple bonehead decisions mm-hmm. as well that we saw, you know, taking pitchers out when you have too many mound visits, things like that. Like just rookie mistakes. I hope those are growing pains he will work out of. That comes with experience. But at the end of the day, I don't think uh, our manager had a ton to do after thinking and reflecting all this time. Um, I'm giving John Schneider a C on the year. With the SC as well, um, I don't think he, I don't know how much a manager really can affect the players on the on the field and performing the way they do. I think it was good. I don't think it was great. I will say one thing: two ejections this year, which matches his um, the amount of ejections he had in his limited time last year. He got a play overturned thirty four point six percent of the time, which is right about league average for him. The only thing that makes me want to um, rank him lower is he had four sack bunts this year, Riley, and I don't want to see that. I don't think you should ever be sacrifice bunting. So the fact he called for a sack bunt four times this year, down thumb from me on Jordan or on uh, John Schneider. But other than that, that's it. And he hates – and he doesn't even play small ball either. Yeah. Like, John Schneider's not a small ball guy. I don't know. I, I think small ball is, is fine in some parts of the game. But, yeah, if John Schneider, whatever. We know he's back next year. I really don't want to spend any more time on our manager until <laughs> until he makes a, a good or a bad decision on the field next year. Yep. Uh, that'll be the end of our episode here. I think um, the only thing left to grade is our episode itself, Riley. I think it's another A+. Plus, and I hope you guys are listening at home also think it's an A+. Plus. Leave your comment down below onto the video and we'll get to you there. Remember, guys, our show is free. We're available on all platforms. So please make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. We're going to be doing this all off season. And if there is any major Blue Jays breaking news, you can bet that Riley and I, or even with some friends, will be here to cover it going forward. Um, Riley, anything else to add before we get out of here? Call our episode today. Uh, it was probably a B minus episode, but uh, you know we'll t- we'll take it for what it's worth. The next one will be an A plus. You can Amen. count on it. No, I'm just just joking. We're just here doing our silly report card things. We've done it every time, and yep. we'll be sure to do it next year. And I do not think do another bold take right now. There's no way I'm handing out another after this year because there's no bigger failure in the foreseeable future than what Alec Manoa did. And I will leave it at that. All right. I hope you are right, Riley, because I would hate to discuss another situation like that going into next season. But until then, we'll see you guys next week. And let's go Blue Jays. Thanks, guys.